Margaret, what on earth are you playing at? <sighs> Luckily, we have just... <laughs> Let's begin again. After introducing yourself and gaining consent, remember to expose the patient from the neck up. Take a step back. Now remember, while they won't test you on all 12 cranial nerve defects at the same time, it is possible that the patient may present with two or three at once. So beware to look for facial symmetry, pupil size, eyelid level, rashes, atrophy, or neck scars. And remember to look for clues from the examiners. If you see a lonely pen torch, maybe they want you to test pupil reflexes. For cranial nerve 1, you most often just stay what you would do and then move on. However, if they present you with something like coffee beans, you can ask the patient to stay what they smell. You can also offer to look inside the nostrils with a nasal speculum. Please. After testing visual acuity with a Snellen chart, you can also check visual fields by confrontation. Komonowski defects include monoocular blindness, bitemporal hemianopias, and homonymous hemianopias. Also be aware to check for a central scotoma with a red hat pin. Thank you. Excellent. Test accommodation with your finger pupillary reflexes with a pen torch, all this while asking a patient to focus on a distant object. Now test the direct and consensual reflexes by looking at the lit and non-lit pupil respectively. These tests involve the optic nerve and parasympathetic outflow from the third cranial nerve. The swinging light test is used to look for an RAPD or Marcus gun pupil. This is where one optic nerve sends less information to the brain than the other. So when a torch is swung from a healthy eye to an unhealthy eye, the brain detects less light than it previously did, and the pupils dilate rather than the remaining pinpoint. To complete this examination, you could say you'd like to perform fundoscopy and use Ishihara plates to assess colour vision. Testing extraocular movements reflects cranial nerves 3, 4 and 6. Ask the patient to report any pain or diplopia and observe the nystagmus. Test each branch of the trigeminal nerve with cotton wool. may also offer to test the corneal reflex, of which the sensory arm is the trigeminal nerve and the efferent arm is the facial nerve. Next, ask the patient to clench their teeth and check for jaw malalignment, and do this while feeling the bulk of temporalis and masseter. Fifth year students may also offer to test the jaw jerk. While you can assess cranial nerve 7 by testing the taste in the anterior two thirds of the tongue, it's preferable to test the muscles of facial expression on both sides. Ask the patient to copy your movements and check for any asymmetry. Keep your lips nice and tight. And now pull this face. Puff out your cheeks. And now keep your lips nice and tight. And now pull this face. To test cranial nerve 8, get the patient to occlude one ear while you whisper three numbers into the other, and then ask them to repeat the numbers back to you. You may also like to perform Rene and Weber's tests using a 512 Hz tuning fork. Can you tell me if it's louder on the bone or by your ear? Air conduction being louder than bone implies a normal result and a positive Rene's test. A negative test is when bone conduction is louder than air. 
and implies an ipsilateral conductive deafness. Place a tuning fork in the centre of the patient's forehead and ask them to report in which ear they can hear the sound loudest. The normal result should be equal in both ears. If the sound is louder in the left ear, this implies a conductive deafness on the left or a sensory neural deafness on the right hand side. And you may like to finish with oroscopy. The cranial nerves 9 and 10 indicate that you would attempt to elicit the gag reflex and assess the uvula for asymmetrical movement as the patient says, ah. A deficit in the left vagus nerve will cause the uvula to deviate to the right. The accessory nerve supplies the ipsilateral trapezius and sternocleidomastoid muscles. Test the power of these muscles against resistance by getting the patient to shrug their shoulders as you push down and by getting the patient to turn their head into your hand. Compare both sides as usual. Can you stick your tongue out for me? Finally, test the hypoglossal nerve by asking the patient to stick their tongue out. Look for any atrophy, fasciculation or asymmetry in tongue position. A defect in the left nerve will make the tongue deviate to the same side. Nice try, Margaret, but remember, it's all about sounding slick. This is how you present your findings. Mr. Visser is comfortable at rest, with no signs of cranial nerve damage in nerves 1 to 11. However, there is atrophy of the left-hand side of the tongue. It deviates towards the left when he protrudes his tongue out. This implies a lower motor neuron lesion of the left hypoglossal nerve. Well, Margaret, I hope you've learned something today. If you have, bravo. If you haven't, it's your own time you're wasting. You should have been listening, to be honest. I'm not going to accept any responsibility for your future actions if you can't pay attention.